Yes, so this is your favorite tour guide. My name is Michael Orleans and I work with Torch Light Tours. Torch Light Tours. Torch Light Tours is a, a reputable tour company based in Ghana and we promote the tour of Ghana, Togo, Benin and Senegal. Today I'm taking you on the city tour of Accra. Where we are now is an adjoining garden of the National Museum. We have a lot of sculptures that depict and tell the story of our tradition and culture. The art fit you see on me was put together by Images Design. You can see it on your screen. You can like their page and order any type of African prints, art fits you get from them. Thank you so much. Uh, what I'm holding now is a typical traditional African woman. Um, an African woman, this is how the shape should be, um, like a Coca-Cola shape. Um, from infancy, they start to adorn them with the traditional African beads. The beads for us is um, it gives the woman a very good shape as they grow up. It also serves different purposes. Um, when the beat starts falling off you, it means you are losing weight. When it becomes tighter, it means you are gaining weight. And uh, there is a particular tribe in Ghana called the Cobras. They make the beautiful best of traditional African beats and they have a, a festival which is a, um, called the Pibeti Rite. It's a, um, an initiation whereby when a woman sees her first menstruation she goes through a lot of rituals uh, because here in Ghana women are keepers of the house so as soon as the young girl sees her first menstruation it means that she's ready to become a woman because she can have a child so the puberty right took the young child to various rituals. They are confined in a room for some time where the elderly woman in the society will take them through a series of teaching. The art of seduction, how to manage home because women are keepers of the house. So they will go through all these rituals and at the end of the day, they will make to sit on the black stool you need to be a virgin before you can go through this rituals. Today, issue with virgin is, you know, a little bit complicated. But in order to maintain the tradition and also leave it for per for posterity, now they have tried to do it from the early stage so that they can leave it behind and maintain the tradition. I'm talking about the PBT right. And at the end of the day, the young children are being showcased in the public square. In the olden days, the bachelors will go and choose their future wife. So this is it about the uh, sculpture we see and how we are done ourselves with traditional African beads. Yeah, so before the invention of uh, modern day mass communication, mass media, African traditionally we have our own way of sending information and one of the medium we use is the drum at the beat of the drum every rhythm sends a message to the community before the introduction of foreign religion on our land I'm talking about Islamic religion and Christianity Africans we have our own way of belief. Our way of worship believe that God is supreme being and you cannot go to him direct. There should be an intermediary. So the intermediary we use to send our message and information to the supreme being was through the oracles, the shrines, the deities. So today uh, the sculptures depict a medicine man resting with a python showcasing his magical powers traditionally our belief this is the pyramid of our traditional belief 
the base is our forefathers or ancestors. When a person live a good life and he, he die, he become an ancestor. It is being likened to uh, what we know in the Bible as saints or the spirit of a just man who are always with us. So when the person live a good life and he die, he become an ancestor. So when you live a good life, you are an ancestor. If you doesn't live a good life, at the end of the day, you are not an ancestor. You'll never be remembered. At every family gathering, a libation is being poured. And when the libation is being poured, the spirit of our ancestors are being called one by one. They are the saints and the just men who have lived and passed, but we believe they are soul and spirit are with us in the living. So where we are now, the sculpture depicts our belief in traditional herbs and plants. Before the introduction of orthodox medicine, Traditionally, we have our own way of administer herbs and plant to kill all manner of sicknesses. So here you can see the medicine man administer concussion to the sick child and this is the mother. So today in Ghana, we practice what we call the dual medication. There are some form of sicknesses you will see um, um, herba plant or herba medication. There are some too you go to hospital and to be given an orthodox medicine. Our traditional herbs and plants still have strong efficacy and potency to heal all manner of sicknesses. So we still use it. We, we use it as a face aid. Of course, when it becomes complicated, then we'll go to hospital for, me for further medical examination to ascertain what is really wrong. But in our houses, in our homes, most of our face aid comes in the form of herbal plants or herbs. What we have now is a replica of a, a palm nut tree. When the palm nut tree is about 10 years and over, uh, it's the bearing of fruit is not that much so we use it for palm wine um, palm tree is one of the most flourished tree we have almost every part is used for something and even when the tree is old and it's calm down we use it to get our tasty palm wine so this is how they do it they will fell the tree create a hole somewhere in the stem, let it, put a batch beneath it to collect the sap. So the sap will be dropping in it and the uh, initial one that comes is very sweet. You will enjoy the taste. And um, from the palm wine, then we will distill to have our what we call apetishi, the strongest gene we have in Ghana. This is a very interesting piece. Um, you can see the man relaxing on the lazy chair, taking care of the child. And you can see on my right, the mother and the daughter pounding fufu. The mother and the daughter pounding fufu. You can see it on my right. And uh, you know, sometimes we say that the African woman does a lot. The man has left all the job to the woman. It's not like that. We believe in division of labor. So the father is taking care of the child, whilst the mother and the daughter are preparing the meal for the day. At the end of the day, it's a division of labor. Everybody is playing their role in the upkeep of the family. I want you to have a look on the wall. This is a traditional Ashanti home. Um, this is how it looks like. The house 
has a lot of charms and ornaments around it to show their protection and how the house is being fortified. A typical traditional home, the doors are very small, narrow for security reasons. And in every traditional Ashanti home, before you enter the house, you need to remove your slippers, wash your hand in the basin. Today we will say you need to sanitize yourself. Our forefathers, ancestors, believe a lot on sanity. And uh, as a result, you cannot go to town and come home not sanitizing yourself, removing your slippers. They had a belief that whilst you are being in town and you are coming home, you might be or some form of spirit will be following you. So as you wash your hand and leave your slippers behind, you are sanitizing yourself before you enter the house to affect anybody in the house with whatever um, thing you have picked from the outside. So this is a little bit about our traditional Ashanti homes and how we do it before we enter our homes. Alright, so now we are in one of the most popular joints in Osu. Where we are now is called the Obano Hotel. Uh, it's one of the best places to sleep when you are in a crowd. And we are also lucky on my right, the number one tour guide in Accra. Not only Accra, he's the national best tour guide of Ghana. He's going to take over from here. So please, I'm pleased to introduce my brother, Ni. Nee who's going to take over the tour for us. How are you? That's good. good. Yes, good. nice meeting you. Nice to meet you You're looking very good. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right, so our brother Ni is taking over for me. He's my senior no. colleague. He always puts me up there. But I, I try to do my best because we talk for us to be paid. And I want to work on you all wherever you are. It might be evening for you. It might be morning for you. It might be afternoon for you. I say good day out there. We are currently at Urbano Hotel and we are going to enjoy ourselves today. I'm going to show you a little bit about Osu, but then first of all to tell you that Urbana is one of the classic places you can sleep in Accra here. And if you come to Osu, it is first you will see entry into Osu. Urbana has one of the top class uh, customer service here. They have good hotels here, their food excellent. You know, they are a joint hotel with also a root apartment joined together. So, if you come to Accra and you want a beautiful place to stay, you want a nice place to stay, think of Urbano and Root Apartments. Today we are going to talk more about Osu or see more about Osu as um, we go on. But I want to tell you that at least a lot of people have read a lot about Osu. But I want to give you an intro of Osu. Osu is one of the places where the Europeans and Italy, you know, enjoy themselves. We will be on the Oxford Street so that you will know. Oxford Street didn't come here by accident, but most of our things that we have here were being influenced by the British colonizing us. So the British saw it thing that, okay, we will name this place as Oxford Street because they have a similar thing back in, in England or in the UK where the streets are full with shops, eating areas, hotels, and other, you know, and things like that. So Oxford Street is one of the busiest streets in Ghana here. We will be going outside for you to see a lot about it. But if you are in Ghana here, especially in Accra and in Usu, there are a lot of places you can There are a lot of eating areas like Papaya, like Frankie's when it comes to pizza and ice cream. You know, they are all over there. There are places like Republic where you can go and sit with some good music. And then also they have what we call the trivia night that goes on there. There is a Apple area where you can watch football and other things. A lot of there are a lot of places. But as we go on, I'll be mentioning it for you to see them. So gear yourself up, we'll be moving out for you to see a lot. Thank you very much. <laughs> Like 
my toy is still on the tour and also Oxford Street. As we told you guys, everything is in Osu. You don't need to carry cash around. You don't need to have all the bulk money around. We have banks here which are safe. You can use your ATM cards here. You talk of the MasterCard, the Visa card, the debit cards, all can come in here. And you can do business right here where you are, whether in the evening, in the afternoon, or in the morning. See, Bank of Africa, we have Asper Bank, we have GCB, we have GT Bank there. All these banks are there for us as clients wherever we are coming from, from all over the world, to come in and enjoy whatever is in Osu. So if you come to shopping, you are here. If it comes to food, you are here. Anything you want to do at all in Osu, you can do business smoothly with your ATM cards. You know? So let's get rolling. As I told you guys, we are still on the Oxford Street. There are a lot to see on the Oxford Street. Green is one of the top fabrics and um, shops in Ghana here. And if you talk about fabric and quality, we have the Ghana textile which is quality and we have the wooden which is also quality. Wooden is one of them. Everybody comes here to shop. Apart from wooden that we have here, if you go down there, there's a stretch of it which you will see as we go. That there are a lot of areas there that you can get there with our painting, with our carvings and everything. So as we walk down the lane, you will see fashion at its best. One of the shops you can find here, this is Nanayao, who is in charge of this area. Everybody who comes here comes to buy souvenirs from this place. You can come in there and see their beautiful artifacts. So this is a beautiful bowl, you can put a lot of things inside. And this is what I want to show you, this is amazing. This is what we call unity. This door that I have here is carving one piece of wood. Once you raise it, it becomes one. Once you open it, it opens up. And then you can put your bowl inside there. So unity is strength. We've been talking for the whole day. I've been working on the Scottish shant. You know, my throat is going off there. I need to cool down. This is fresh coconut. Yes. So I'm going to have the guy book, you know, crack one for me to drink so that I'll quench my thirst. After that, I'll tell you important about coconut. Boss, shall I have a hit and hit and open and give me a. This is a leather bag and they have molded it in such a way that you can know that it is from Ghana. We have the flag in there, the colors of the flag and the black star there. You need to come. We need to get a lot of these things and give it to the kids. Give it to adults, wherever they are. You can keep your money inside, you can keep your jewelry inside. You can, you can move around with it. Your passport and everything can be in here as you walk around. So as you come to Ghana, Guys, this is on Oxford Street, Osu. You see here is curry shell. In our local palette, we would say CDA. It is from this shell that we got our currency CD that we are using today. Because in the olden days, we were using these shells as a mode of um, trading. So this was what we were trading in in the Akan language we call it CDA and that is where we got our CD from. Today, there's a lot of things we are doing out of it. One of the products we are getting out of it is the necklace. This will not cost you anything less than $30 and you can have one. You can have earrings out of it, you can have bangles out of it, but this is one of the keys I love so much because once you put it on your neck, for the ladies, it covers everywhere and it looks beautiful as you can see on me. So guys out there, once you get to Oxford Street Osu, all these things will come together for you guys. Hi everybody out there, we are on the road. We have currently moved away from Oxford Street. We are now in the center of Accra. We are in Accra now. And then I can talk about here, we are at the Black Star Square or the independent square. Before I go on with where we are, I'll tell you a little bit about Accra. P 
people from Accra here, I believe that they are indigents who migrated all the way from Israel to their present place. And then also others are saying that they are people who came all the way from Nigeria to their present place. They are meek about the history. But I tell you about the history that they have similarities between people in Israel in terms of their Passover celebration and the people in Accra with their home war. And that is why people are associated them coming from Israel or Nigeria. But then it is a trail that they move all the way to their present settlement and that is why they have them here. Accra is one of the older cities in Ghana here. People are saying that it's over 100 years, people are saying it's over 200 years. But hey, don't let us get into those mathematics. We are in Accra and I'm going to tell you about the importance of where we are now. We are at the Black Star Square, which used to be the second largest open air space in the world after Tiananmen Square. Kwame Nkrumah built this so that it will be able to, everybody in Africa will be able to use it. Here comes Kwame Nkrumah in it because he was thinking more of Africa than only Ghana. So if you look behind me, the hat you see there looks like an A, which stands for Africa. If you look at it well, and that is where the dignitaries will sit, where you have the black star, and then something that has to do with that hat that you have there. This area is where we, whenever a president has been elected, they will do what we call the legal and judicial swearing in in the parliament house. But this is where they will come for everybody to see when the president is swearing in. Another thing we do here is that we also celebrate our Independence Day, which is the 6th of March. Every year we celebrate it here at the Independence Square. We have school children, we have workers, we have the security services who also come here and then have the pass, the March pass here also. And then we celebrate it where the president gives a speech to the entire nation. We also have other activities that goes on here, both entertainment, um, you can talk of um, sports, you can talk of music concerts, you can talk of um, revivals that bring religion, you can talk of the Muslims. They also come here for their last prayers. So a lot of activities goes on here at the Independence Square or the Black Star Square. Just in front of me is what we call the Unknown Soldier. The Unknown Soldier stands for all the soldiers the Second World War to gain independence for our country, those who share their blood for our nation and then also for gaining independence. So it stands for them. That is where we are. And then also behind the soldier, we have the Freedom and Justice Monument. We will go there for you to see more of it. And then on top of it is the Black Star Square or the Black Star Symbol. This is a symbol that Kwame Nkrumah borrowed from his wonderful friend, Marcus Garvey, to use. So even if you look at our, our Ghana flag, you see the black star in the middle, it's there. Just by it also is our sports stadium. And then we have a 20,000 capacity stadium there, which we play soccer, or other people will say football. Then by it, we have the ministries. But I want to give you one specific thing, important thing about this area. The British at that time wanted to use here as a memorial ground or a memorial garden. Where Kwame Nkrumah said, no, you cannot use the entire place to do that. But we have other things that we can use to do it. That is when he started building the offices, built the stadium, and then where we are, the magnificent place where we are today. So as you know, there's more that I can tell you, but this is a tidbit for you. Come to Ghana, come with Torchlight, and we will explore more in Ghana here. Thank you. So you have every kind of product that you want to have here 
being it from the hair dyes, being it fabrics, being it uh, fresh fish, being it vegetables, utensils, name it all. We have it all here at the Makola Market. I shop here, whatever I'm wearing here, I got it from here. My shoes, I got it from here. So anything that you want, even this hat I am wearing, I got it from this market. So anything you want, if you are in Ghana here, come to the Mongola market and you will get it. What you see here now, it's the rush hour, everybody is going home now. People are closing going home. But still, there is market going on here. So guys out there, Tot Lightwell like is calling you. He like Tot Guide is calling you. Come to Ghana in 2021 and you have a lot of this blast for you. Enjoy the series as we go. So the fort was used as a slave fort. Apart from that, most people have lost this touch. But Accra was the place where tunnels were created because there was a lot of battle between the local people and the Europeans. So in Jamestown alone, we have about three channels or three underground tunnels that leads to the fort and to the ocean so that when they are taking their people out, nobody will see. Aside from this one as well, they use the fort also as a prison. And then the most famous person that you can talk about is our president, the first president of Ghana, called Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, the one that we refer to as the father of Pan-Africanism in Ghana. He was in prison here because he had protested against the British that they should give us our independence. He was in prison when he had an election and he won and then he was released from prison. So Kwame Nkrumah was released from prison to become the first prime minister of this country. Aside, the, they fought again we also have what you can see at the back there called the Bible House. The Bible House was then called the Elder Dempster Office. That is where all the people that were taken away, their documentation were done. And when you go to England, they have a museum for slavery. And that is where you're going to see a lot of the people that were taken out. So assuming they took maybe 700 people from James Port, you will you see the name of the ship, you see the name of the captain, and then you see the number of people on board. Sometimes on the same boat, you will see that the name of the ship is there, the name of the captain is there, but the name, the group of the people are not there. Because there were pirates who were also attacking slave ships. And then they were taking them away and they also do their own business. So this building was used as a registration post. Most of you know much about Marcos Garvey. Marcos Garvey established the blaster line and his idea was to bring African people back to the continent. He couldn't make it realize, but our first president in Kuma, who also see himself or take Dr. Marcos Garvey as his mentor, also bring this vision into fruition. So when they build the, the blaster line ships in Ghana, those pe most people who travel in the 60s and the 70s use the blaster line ship. They have their office here. Why? Because the infrastructure was already there. Again, when the blaster line moved from here to Tema, this place was converted and now used as a Bible house. So Ghana have about 60 plus percent of the population as Christians. So any Bible that comes into the country comes in right here. Then over there we have the lighthouse. The lighthouse was used as a navigation post. Today it has become one of the landmarks in Accra or in Jamestown. So anything you see about Jamestown, you see the lighthouse. And also there's a compound which was used for two reasons. By 1910, Europeans were, before 1910, Europeans were drinking water from wells or from rainwater harvesting and other sorts of water sources. Then the local people were paying a lot of tasks to the Europeans and then they decided that, okay, we need to do something. The local people said, we need treated water. So they have to do treated water and pump it out. But this time, they have a garden, the governor and the soldiers will normally come and sit out there and drink their water whilst they also have the pump, the tap water in people's houses, but this time we have what we call the standpipes. You have to go with the, your jerrycan or gallons to fetch water for your home. Then they have the memorial wall or the memorial epitaph, which serves as a wall that the locals and the British fought with their shanties and rolled over them and put it out there. So, in brief, I'll say that again, Jamestown has become one of the places where you talk about the art industry. Jamestown is known for art. So when you talk about graffiti arts or um, graffiti art, Jameson is the best place. And we have one of the biggest festivals in, in, in Africa <coughs> called Chalewati. Chalewati means, my friend, let's go. 
So my friend Let's Go Art Festival brings out any form of art from the art, from the drawings to paint, paintings to poetry, music, everything that falls within the art comes on here in August. So next year August, I could tell you that the third week in August, Charlie Water is starting. So prepare yourself and mash up your, your energy and come over next year August. Thank you very much. Once again, you're welcome to Jamestown. Thank you. All right, we are continuing with our city tour of Accra. Where we are now is a very important site. Uh, the whole area is called the Brazilian Lane, and the house is called the Brazilian House. Um, it's a very important edifice, as I said. Somewhere 1836, a group of enslaved Africans made their way back to the Guinea coast when slave trade was abolished. Uh, they landed first in Jamestown, where we are now. Some continue to Togo, others continue to Benin and Nigeria. When they landed, the people of Accra accepted them as one of their own. They live with them, they integrate so well in the society. So today, when you talk about uh, the elites in Accra, you can talk about uh, some of the descendants of Africans and slave Africans who made their way back to Ghana or the Guinea coast when the slave trade was abolished. So we are going to um, walk around, uh, take the tour of the area, see the pictures, where they first landed. Then the general history about Jamestown, you know, we have already talked about it. So follow me, let's have a look. All right, so the bay you see here uh, used to be the first harbor the British built uh, during the colonial days. So this is where the enslaved African who made their way from Brazil. Um, this is where they landed before they integrate uh, with the people of Accra from this very particular area. So it used to be the biggest coastal slum in Ghana but today the people have been ejected you can see there's a construction going on they want to put together a modern harbor which will benefit the people more so as you can see it's also a major fishing community you can see uh, pockets of um, canoes dotted all over the area uh in the morning you will see them relaxing uh often time they go to the sea in the night in the morning they will bring their catch and they take their time to make their nets and uh in ghana symbolically tuesdays you can't go fishing on tuesday it's a taboo to go fishing on tuesday our ancestors in their own wisdom institute this conservation concept so that the fish can replenish itself because when you go to sea every day a day will come you will go there will be no catch so our ancestors in their own wisdom institute this conservation add a taboo to it because we are very much um people who um, have a great sense of belief so because of that they made it a taboo but in reality it's a conservation so that when you go to fish from monday to sunday or all the days of the week tuesday you don't have to fish okay so this is your tour guide, Michael Kojua Lens uh, from the Torchlight Tours. Um, it's a great opportunity to be with you once again. We are continuing with the city tour of Accra. Uh, where we are now is the Kwame Nkrumah Memorial Park. And my outfit has always been by Images Design. You can check them up on your screen. 
they have best of African um, adornments and dresses that you can pick from and other outfits and other designs. So today we are lucky to have in our midst the man of this park. I call him the man of this park. He, he is going to take us on the tour of the Kwame Nkrumah Memorial Park. He's going to give us that escorted um, explanation over the whole area, how it came about. So please, stay groove and listen to him. Thank you so much. So my name is Edward, as my brother said, but that's my English name. But you can also call me Kofi, because I was born on a Friday as a male. Now, this is a memorial park for the first president of Ghana, who is Osajifo Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. And the reason why we have the monument on this particular ground and site is that during our colonial era, this was where the British played polo. So this was called the old polo grounds and meant for only British. Natives or locals were not allowed to come here. So when it was due for us to get independence, symbolically, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah chose these grounds to make his independence declaration. So that's the importance of these grounds to the history of Ghana. And in fact, the spot where his statue is erected was where he stood and made his speech on the eve of 6 March 1957. And Ghana was the first country south of the Sahara to have gotten independence. So among the things he said here was that, quote, the independence of Ghana would be meaningless unless it was linked with the total liberation of the African continent. And that it was time to prove to the whole world that given the same opportunity, the black man was also capable of managing his own affairs. So on the park, there's also a mausoleum where Dr. Nkrumah was eventually laid to rest. Um, we have a museum which houses some of his things he used when he was president and as, during his personal lives as a private person. So there's a lot to see when you come here. And since this monument was opened on July 1st, 1992, besides tourists visiting, we also, we've also had a lot of heads of state visiting here. And some of them took the opportunity to plant trees. So you would see, you would find a tree here planted by the late Nelson Mandela of South Africa. We have one planted by the late Robert Mugabe of Zimbabwe. And there are others by presidents of Kenya, Namibia, Angola, and other African countries as well. So right on the park also, we have some of it. One, um, a car which he got as a gift from President Kennedy in 1961, which was actually a Cadillac. So he's somewhere parked on the car, on the, on, on, on the park. Right there is a mausoleum which contains the final remains of Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, our first president. So he's not very there alone, but he's actually laid to rest with his wife. He actually married an Egyptian, Egyptian lady who was called Fatia Nkrumah, and both of them were laid to rest in there. So we can pay our respects to them. So we have here a broken statue. Now, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah was the president of Ghana until 1966, 24th of February, when his government was unfortunately overthrown through a military and police coup d'etat. He was actually not in this country. He had traveled abroad. He was on his way to Vietnam for a visit where the coup happened behind him. So he couldn't return home and went into exile in a country called Guinea, which is also in West Africa. So in the course of the military coup, I would say some ignorant Ghanaians attacked and destroyed a lot of Kwame Nkrumah's things. But this was one of his statues which was made soon after independence, originally complete, and then erected in front of our old parliament house. And in fact, in 1964, Muhammad Ali visited Ghana, and then he stood in front of the statue to take a picture, which is on display in the museum. So the statue was attacked in front of the old parliament house during the coup, so we lost and it was dismembered to its current state. And until recently, even the broken head of the statue had been missing. It was only in 2009 that somebody 
return it. And for us to keep the history still alive, that is why the head was separate from the body, to tell the story and the history of what actually happened to him and Ghana after the coup in 1966. So around us, we also have statues blowing on horns. These are the horn blowers. But these are also expressing an aspect of Ghanaian traditional culture. In Ghana, especially in the south, when we have a festival or a big occasion and the chief or the king is coming, often some of his servants would lead him as praise singers, blow horns to announce his arrival. And similarly, when a prominent person dies here, traditionally, horns are also blown to announce the person's death. So symbolically, they are doing the same thing for Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. But the only difference is that um, they blow the horns in real life while standing. But here they are kneeling because they are giving him honor or reverence. So I would urge you to visit this place where you are in Ghana. And it's going to be very exciting. So looking forward to seeing you in Ghana. So thank you. All right. So we are continuing with our city tour of Accra. Where we are now is the Coffin Fantasy. Coffin Fantasy is the name. Quite fascinating. I know you'll be thinking, what is Coffin Fantasy? So before I go into the Coffin Fantasy, I will tell you a brief about how Ghana we celebrate the dead. Uh, in Ghana, when you uh, in our traditional settings, we believe in reincarnation. We believe there is life after death. And every departed soul needed to be given a befitting barrier. So if somebody passed away in your family, it's your duty to give that person a befitting barrier because they are going in to prepare a place for us. So we celebrate the dead. Barrier service is one of the festivals we have. It's an occasion whereby family and friends, sympathizers come together. So it's a major festival. So what we see here is the Coffin Fantasy. Uh, initially it was done by the chiefs and elders, but today uh, any other family member can order one for your uh, loved one who has departed. So this coffin are made by skillful carpenters. So they carve a casket for you based upon your profession or something that you love so much. So if you love ice cream, they will carve an ice cream casket for you. If you love to rap or sing, when you are there, they can carve a mic casket for you if you love to drink then of course they will carve a beer casket for you let's talk about funerals in ghana like i said earlier funerals are like festival in ghana uh, because of the importance we attach to it sometimes the body can be in the mortuary for months i know you ask why so the reason being that Funerals are festival is a moment where families come together to celebrate the dead. So they have to plan a date which is suitable to everybody. So usually when somebody passes away, in a week the family will sit down and plan for the burial. The burial planning mostly based on the specific date which is going to be agreed by all the family members. So sometimes the date can be three months, four months, six months. In fact, some get to the mortuary and stay there for years because of how they want the funeral to be. So, and on the day of the funeral, we usually use three days for our funeral. The first day is the wakekeeping service and the fallen pass the body, giving your last respect to the departed soul. Saturday is the burial service, 
where the person is being buried. Sunday is the Thanksgiving service where family thanks sympathizers and friends who come to contribute to uh, give the disease the departed um, um, the departed so a very befitting barrier and um, after that in 40 days they will sit down and also um, have a family gathering to do what we call um, looking into the estate of the person some can be shared to the family if the person has a will a written um, legal will then that will go into the uh, prospective um, uh, uh, recipient but if not the case what they will do is the family will have a way to share the estate of the person to the family and also the children the spouses and whoever is close to the uh, diseased person so that is little about funerals in ghana so this is little about the coffin fantasy um, which mostly found in the coastal area of ghana and um, if you need one they will come one for you based upon your specification and how you want it and we can ship it over to you so this is the coffin fantasy have a look around you can choose one and i'll, I'll send it to you thank you so much <laughs>
There's a lot of them, so we're, we're gonna kind of go quickly because it can take hours if we do it the other way. Uh, you just heard the young man do a poco carignani. Uh, we come here to Queen T. Now, Queen T was one of the queens from the 18th dynasty, Egypt. Uh, her husband, Amenhotep III, was a very powerful uh, uh, pharaoh. The reason she's here is because she had inordinate influence over the pharaoh and also not just the pharaoh but the kingdom. She was like a foreign affairs minister and also she was very um, uh, powerful in her own right. So let me just keep moving. Uh, Marcus Garvey, the reason Marcus Garvey is in the front is because uh, we look back now and we see Garvey's vision saying that we have to build an Africa that is powerful and sovereign. If anyone black in the world is ever going to have something resembling safety and now in the middle of everything that's going on in the U.S. and other places, we wish we did have some powerful sovereign entity, polity that could provide some kind of um, protection opportunities for the race. That was Garvey's vision and it's just as uh, important now as it was then from Jamaica, for those of you who don't know. Uh, this is, of course, Kwame Nkrumah. You all know Nkrumah. Uh, but I intentionally put these words here um, just because a lot of people don't know Garvey. And so I thought it was important to show that uh, Nkrumah, who had read all of these big European thinkers, said the one that still had the most influence on him uh, was reading the, the philosophies and opinions of Marcus Garvey. So the Black Star Line, all of that came from Garvey. Even a lot of the colors that you're using in your flag, a lot of these things were Garvey's influence on Nkrumah. And as you go through, you'll find a lot more. You may remember uh, Ghana had a Black Star Line at one time, and that's where it, that's where it came from. <clears throat> Trying to make sure that we give uh, proper attention to the, the people who are actually from here and who have founded the place, uh, Jonas Karbu and Te Jangma, uh, the first. And so even when the youngsters from Ning New Ningo and locally come around, we'd like for them to know that we know who started the place. It's been raining, so the flags aren't waving today, but uh, usually we try to do a little bit of, uh, you know, give some uh, shout out, as they say, to all of the different regions. Uh, we have our red, black, and green. We, sometimes that's a flag. That's Garvey's original colors, the uh, red, the black, and the green. We got Jamaica, uh, Ethiopia, and of course, Ghana. So we're trying to represent. Of course, one day we may put more flags to even be a broader representation, but that's what we are. We say, welcome to the African ancestral wall, Leazare, which is uh, Gruni for welcome, welcoming the people. Uh, I was saying that we start here with Eve because uh, I was saying any geneticist who now even has a bachelor's degree knows that uh, humanity started in Africa, in East Africa in particular, somewhere around 200,000 years ago. And uh, the interesting thing is that, that I try to explain to the students, and I'll kind of tell you how I talk to the students about it, is I try to let them realize that for 130,000 years, no one had left the African continent. So no one left about 60 or 70,000 years ago. So there was no one in China, there was no one in Australia, there was no one in America. Every human being in the world was on the African continent. 70,000 years ago, they began to trickle out and that's who populated the world. So we talk about how the whites became whites through uh, shedding the metal melanin because of the sun, you know, and they didn't need all the vitamin D and all those kinds of things. So we like to start there, and I call her Eve for a reason. Sometimes people say, well, you know, that doesn't comport, that doesn't look like the one that was in my Sunday school book. And that's exactly the point. That's why we're here today, because we're trying to get some truth in the system. Fought Japanese, uh, did all of these things, but when they didn't get their due, they went for it, they were shot. That sparked the Accra riots. And that's really the unraveling of the colonial system here in Ghana. Maurice Bishop from Grenada, a Maurice Bishop was kind of like the Fidel Castro of his time, or he potentially could have been. Uh, you know, he reduced uh, illiteracy to almost zero, and he just did all of the things in a country that you want them to do. They only had 100,000 people. Of course, they were invaded by America. I don't know if people remember that during the Reagan administration. It's only 100,000 people, but they wiped out their whole revolution, wiped out the whole thing they were doing. 
Uh, this is uh, Nomaton and Amazon Warriors from the homie uh, phone women. Uh, now, they, you can find out a lot about their ferocity by reading what the French had to say about them because uh, they basically started out kind of with security and ended up being the, some of the frontline people for, for Bahanzen uh, when they were struggling against the French. So they call them the Amazon warrior after the uh, you know, mythical Amazons. Uh, uh, Edward Mil Mil Wilmot Blyden, he's probably the father of Pan-Africanism. Now you'll see St. Thomas, which is the Virgin Islands, Liberia. Uh, he ended up, I have Liberia because he moved to Liberia and really had his, his career in Liberia, you know. Established college, and he's also a diplomat. And he wrote a book called uh, Christianity, Islam, and the Negro Race, which is still one of the, the classics at the time. Uh, Islam and the Negro Race. He's written other ones too. Um, uh, uh, Africa for the Africans, uh, some other ones. But anyway, one of the brilliant thinkers that we brought. Steve Biko, I was mentioning to you earlier, a lot of times when I bring the children here, they haven't heard of apartheid, so I have to tell them first about apartheid, then about Biko. And, uh, you know, South African Student Association, his book, I Write What I Like, you can find a lot of his writings. Um, you know, really well known for uh, the Black Consciousness Movement and just a brilliant all-around thinker. Of course, he was also killed by the apartheid regime uh, early, tortured and killed. Good evening. My name is Sonny Ali. I was born in Songhai. Songhai was a smaller kingdom at the time I was born. As I grew older, I was taught all about war and how to fight. That would help me as I grew into a man because I wanted some guys to grow from a smaller kingdom into a great empire. To expand some guy into a great empire, I used my army to conquer the Jen, Timbuktu, and the lands of the Fulani. I also had to defend some guy against attacks from the Dogon and the Tarek. The Mosi also had very strong warriors, but was able to keep them out. On the Great Niger River, I built a strong navy of more than 400 large boats. They helped defend our nation and protected our trade. I, I divided our empire into many provinces, which were like small states. They all had their own leaders, but, the, the, but all the leaders worked for me. Now, by 1476, some guy had turned into a great empire. Now the Arabs, the Arab Muslims who visited my country, they didn't want me to practice my own African traditional faith. They wanted me to follow theirs. Never, I'll never, hold, I'll never throw away the face of my African ancestors. They can say what they want or write what they want. I'm the son of the soul of some guy, not Arabia the son of the soul of Songhai, not Arabia. And getting out. Uh, Samora Michelle, uh, Mozambique, is like, uh, he was another one I was mentioning that was actually trained in their areas, uh, uh, Tanzania. He was a nurse by training, but um, of course they had to struggle against the Portuguese anti-colonial struggle. Unfortunately, he was killed uh, in the airline crash, which we, a lot of people speculate was orchestrated by the South Africans but a real freedom fighter. Nanny of Jamaica, born in Ghana, moved to Jamaica, not moved, you know, during the slave trade, was moved to Jamaica. And uh, she was so powerful that basically the British had to finally just give her her own section of the island. You know, they call it, and it's still there today, they call it Nanny Town, but it was a whole big section back then because she was a maroon. They, she would raid the place, they would fight, they'd be killing people, then they'd go back to their own place, so finally the British said, enough. Enough of that, yeah. And there was Maroons as a general term for people who got out of the, the slave plantations and made their own kind of communities around. So it wasn't just Jamaica, but she was one of the most famous. The interesting thing there, you know, they have even today the Chermatang, the, the uh, Champong, all of these people are still in Jamaica today. Some of them, you know, so there's a lot of Ghanaian. Uh, Haile Selassie, Rastafari. And a lot of times people, I'm sorry, I'm looking up this guy. A lot of times people don't realize that that's Rastafari is his name. You know, he was born uh, Liege Ras Makonan, 
and then as you get older, especially if you're in the kind of the uh, royalty, you know, you get the Ross title. So he's Ross Tafara Makonan, which is close to Ross. But he's here because, you know, he tried to organize uh, his people there and um, modernize. And of course, he had to struggle against the Italians also, not as successfully as uh, the one down here, Menelik. But okay, it's going to get dark. So, uh, Pia. This is uh, 25th Dynasty, ancient Kemet. Uh, this is when the Africans came and reunited Kemet again. 25th Dynasty is 714 BC. As you'll see, the dynasty started at like more than 3000 BC. Shaka, the Zulu king, um, consolidated a lot of property, a lot of land. Of course, if you were one of the ones that were taken over, you may not like it, but he, he made things a whole lot more difficult for penetration by the Europeans later afterwards. Uh, Fannie Lou Hamer, when I was growing up, blacks couldn't vote, you know, so she was one of our great anti or pro voting advocates. She was taken, beaten, tortured, all the rest of it. Good evening. My name is Robert Nestamani. I was born in Jamaica in a place called Trench Town. I started singing when I was still in primary school and I met my friend Bani Wayla. We are best friends and we both love the music. We both moved to a place called Trench Town and we listen to more of the Maker's Car music. We also listen to a lot of music played by African Americans. In Trench Town, I met another young musician named Peter Tosh. He helped me to learn to play the guitar. In those days, we played outside behind houses. Not many people had heard our music then. But we kept on practicing and playing, practicing and playing. You know, if you want to be the best at something, you have to keep on practicing. You have to work hard. I married a beautiful black woman named Rita. We both sang together in a group called The Wailers. I lived a short time in America, and when I went back to Jamaica, I learned more history and became a Rastafarian. We called our God Jah. We believed that we needed to return back to Africa. We felt like Haile Selassie, the leader of Ethiopia, was the holy man we have been waiting for. For us, a place like America was a terrible Babylon that we read about in the Bible. We needed to leave those places. We needed to escape. We wanted exodus. The whalers made beautiful music together like Stir It Up, Lively Up Yourself, the sun is shining and Kaya. We loved making music, but I knew I had to use my music to make peace in Jamaica and to let Africans all around the world know that we had to work together. Uh, I'm a Cesar who started uh, Negritude, a uh, literary movement among French-speaking uh, Caribbeans and Africans. Samurai Touré fought the French all the way across West Africa, Kwame Touré. A uh, young scholar from America, Trinidad, and ended up in Guinea. Our great teachers, John Henry Clark and Yosef Ben Yakinen, uh, historians, engineers, all of that. The great Winnie Mandela, Mama Africa fighting away. Francis Cress Wilson, one of our great psychiatrists in the U.S. So that's a quick run through. Hope it helped you. Any... And just to wrap it up, anyone who would like to come get a full tour. Uh, here at the African Ancestor Wall. Um, we'd love to see you. You can go to YouTube and find a lot of uh, what you saw here and maybe a little more or less detail depending. And uh, uh, we're just trying to teach the youngsters and get African culture history to be mainstream so everybody has access to it. So thanks a lot. Family and friends, I guess this has been very, very awesome. I left the seat for Jerry Johnson. He has taken us on a, a totally fantastic educational road coaster. And I think we have all learned so much. So anytime you are in Ghana or you are planning a trip down here, remember to visit the African Ancestral Wall located in Pam Pram of Ghana and outskirts of Accra. Thank you so much. Um, I believe we have all learned something and um, we will henceforth as an Africans know that we have um, a good, great 
forefathers who we can emulate and learn from and this is something we really need to push forward to move africa to the top thank you once again this is your tour guide michael kojo lens nice having you stay with me